Okay, welcome back to the deep dive. Today, we're looking at something that, uh, well, it's caused a bit of a stir recently. Hmm. The delay of the Axiom 4 space mission. You've pulled together some great sources on this, and they really do give a clearer picture than just the headlines. Yeah, that's the plan. Our sort of mission for this dive is to use those sources to really understand the, you know, the technical reasons behind this delay, and also why it's more than just a schedule change, and frankly, what it tells us about sending people safely into space. Right, and this isn't just any old mission, is it? It's a uh, a major international thing, a collaboration between ISRO, that's India's space agency, mm -hmm. NASA, obviously, and Axiom Space. It feels like a pretty big milestone for global cooperation up there. Absolutely. And, you know, for India specifically, this mission carries a lot of historical significance. It was all set to fly the first Indian astronaut to the International Space Station. Group Captain Shopanshu Shukla, right, a decorated Indian Air Force pilot. He'd be only the second Indian ever in space. The first was uh, Wing Commander Rakesh Sharma way back in 1984. So yeah, a long-awaited return for India to human spaceflight. And it's not just India. The sources point out this is also the return mission for astronauts from Poland's Swawazu's Nasty Wisniewski and Hungary with Tibor Kapu. It's been over 40 years for both those countries too, so quite a lineup. Wow, and commanding this international crew, none other than Peggy Whitson, a NASA legend. Indeed, a very experienced commander. The plan sounded ambitious. Two weeks on the ISS, over 60 experiments from, what, 31 countries? That's a serious amount of science packed in. It really was. It was all lined up for June 11th, 2025. Mm. But then, well, then came the postponement. And the reason cuts right to the heart of human spaceflight. <laughs> safety. Mm. Always safety first. A critical technical issue popped up during pre-launch testing. Okay, so this is where we really dive in. Using the sources, let's get specific about that technical problem. We need to make this understandable. Where do we start? Well, the key is when they found it. It happened during something called a static fire test. Static fire test. Yeah. Okay, sounds... Energetic. What exactly is that for a rocket like the Falcon 9 they're using here? Think of it like the final full power dress rehearsal for the engines, but without actually going anywhere, the rockets clamp down hard onto the launch pad, really securely held. So the engines fire up full blast, but the rocket itself stays completely still. That's it, exactly. Full thrust, huge power unleashed, but it doesn't move an inch. And during those few seconds, engineers are just, you know, drowning in data from hundreds, maybe thousands of sensors, checking everything, fuel flow, combustion stability, pressures, temperatures, basically making sure every single dial reads exactly right before they commit to launch. It's that last crucial check. The sources mentioned a seven second hot test. Is that literally how long the engines fire? And uh, why just seven seconds? Seems short. Yep, seven seconds. It sounds short, but it's very precisely calculated. It's long enough to get all the engine systems fully running, collect all that vital performance data, and spot any problems. But, and this is important, it's also short enough to minimize stress on the engines. They're incredibly complex, expensive pieces of kit and, you know, save fuel. Okay, so it's like running a really complex machine just long enough to be sure it's working perfectly without overdoing it. Exactly. Seven seconds hits that sweet spot for verification. You get the data you need without excessive wear or cost. Got it. So during this particular seven second test, something went wrong and the sources pinpointed it to the booster stage's propulsion bay. Right, uh, quick rocket anatomy lesson. Booster stage propulsion bay, what are we talking about? Sure thing. Think of a big rocket like the Falcon 9. Well, kind of like a tall building. The booster stage is that massive first section at the bottom, the ground floor, plus quite a few levels up. This is the real powerhouse. It's got the main engines, nine Merlin engines on the Falcon 9, and carries most of the fuel and oxidizer for that initial liftoff and push through the thickest part of the atmosphere. Its whole job is to get the rest of the rocket going fast enough and high enough before it drops away. Okay, the big lifter at the base and the propulsion bay inside that booster. Right, the propulsion bay is basically the engine compartment at the very bottom of the booster, right around those engines. It's a, uh, well, it's a really dense, complex area full of pipes, valves, pumps, sensors, wires, structural bits, everything. This is where the fuel and the oxidizer get mixed just right and fed into those engines. Think of it like the, um, the heart and circulatory system just for the engine. So critical, very complicated space. And that's where they found the leak. Correct. The sources say that during that static fire test, sensors picked up that one of the propellants was escaping somewhere in that propulsion bay. And they identified it specifically as a LOX leak. LOX. LOX. Really? What is LOX exactly? And why is keeping it contained so vital for a rocket? LOX stands for liquid oxygen. 
It's literally the oxygen we breathe, but it's been shelled down to an unbelievably cold temperature, about minus 183 degrees Celsius or uh, minus 297 Fahrenheit. At that temperature, it becomes a liquid. Wow, that is incredibly cold. Why bother making a liquid? It comes down to density, efficiency. As a liquid, you can pack way, way more oxygen into the same tank volume compared to if it were a gas. Rockets have to carry their own oxygen supply, remember? There's no air in space. Fuel needs oxygen to burn, that's basic combustion. So LOX is the essential oxidizer part of the equation. It mixes with the fuel, burns, and creates that massive thrust. Okay, concentrated oxygen, super cold, absolutely necessary for the engines. Now, how do they detect a LOX leak in that packed propulsion bay during such a short test? And critically, why is that specific kind of leak so incredibly dangerous? During the static fire, they've got all sorts of sensors aimed right at that bay. Sophisticated ones, uh, chemical sniffers, temperature sensors, pressure gauges, even high-speed cameras. They can pick up the escaping LOX, maybe sense it's extreme cold, maybe even see a plume or frosting where it's leaking from. And finding that immediately flags the mission. Why isn't it just a minor plumbing issue? Why is a LOX leak there so bad? Oh, it's far from minor. It's potentially catastrophic. There are several huge dangers. First, the most obvious one, maybe fire and explosion risk. Liquid oxygen is an incredibly potent oxidizer. It makes things burn fiercely. Materials that normally wouldn't catch fire easily, like certain metals or composites used in the rocket, can become highly flammable in its presence. And remember, the rocket fuel is right there too, in the same bay. A LOX leak basically creates this hyper flammable environment where even a tiny spark from friction or maybe an electrical short could cause a massive fire or a devastating explosion. So it turns the engine room into a potential bomb. Pretty much. Second danger, cryogenic damage. That escaping LOX at minus 183 Celsius, it flash freezes anything it touches that isn't designed for such extreme cold. This can make materials brittle, causing them to crack. Seals can fail. Valves or sensors could freeze solid and just stop working. Imagine a critical valve freezing stuck open or shut during flight. Yeah, that sounds absolutely terrifying. It is. Then third, a leak means you're losing oxidizer. The engines need a very precise mix, a specific ratio of fuel to oxidizer to work efficiently and safely. If you're leaking LOX, that ratio goes out the window. This can cause engines to underperform, maybe shut down unexpectedly or become unstable. Any of those could lead to losing control of the rocket or even structural failure during ascent. And the ultimate concern underlying all of that is? Crew safety. Always. All those potential failures, fire, freezing damage, engine problems, they all directly threaten the lives of the astronauts sitting right on top of that whole system. Launch and ascent, these are the most dangerous, most dynamic parts of the whole mission. Any known problem, any known risk has to be fixed, no question. This is where the sources get really insightful, I think. Some people might think, okay, a leak, can't they just you know slap a patch on it, go, huh? Mm -hmm. But this triggers a full postponement. What does that decision really tell us about how human spaceflight works today and about the agencies involved? Right. That decision to postpone, it speaks volumes. It really embodies these core principles of modern human spaceflight, principles learned the hard way over decades. The first is just an absolute zero tolerance for known risks. If testing revealed a problem, you stop. You fix it. You verify the fix, period. There's no, oh, it'll probably be okay. Not when human lives are involved. That's almost like a law written from the lessons of history. Eliminating known uncertainties, not just trying to manage possibilities. Exactly. It also shows they stick to strict international standards. This isn't just one group's mission. You've got ISRO, NASA, Axiom, SpaceX. They all have incredibly high safety bars. A known LOX leak like this. It fails everyone's safety review. They all have to agree it's safe to fly. And you mentioned historical lessons. Yes. Sadly, we just need to think back to disasters like Challenger or Columbia. In both cases, investigations later found that technical issues, sometimes issues that were known about or seemed minor at the time, were allowed to fly and they led directly to the loss of the crew. So today's rigorous testing and the willingness to say stop, even when it's inconvenient or disappointing, that's a direct result of learning from those tragedies. It's a commitment. And what about ISRO's role here? as a major partner. How does this reflect on them? I think it really highlights ISR's commitment to absolutely world-class technical standards and safety culture. India is stepping back into human spaceflight in a big way, partnering as equals with NASA and others. By fully supporting this delay because of a technical finding, ISRO shows they prioritize safety and technical correctness above everything else, even above the understandable national pride and excitement around launching their astronaut after 40 years. It says a lot about their engineering maturity. 
So what's the process now? How do they go about fixing something like a LOX leak deep inside that complex propulsion bay? It's painstaking work. Step one is always diagnosis, finding the exact spot, the precise source of the leak. That means carefully removing insulation, maybe taking some components apart, using specialized leak detectors, running pressure checks, analyzing all that sensor data from the test fire again. It's real engineering detective work. Hunting down that one faulty seal or fitting in that whole complicated mess of pipes and wires. Exactly. Once they find it, then comes the repair. That could mean replacing a seal, tightening a connection, maybe fixing or swapping out a section of pipe, or maybe even replacing a larger component if the extreme cold caused damage. And once it's fixed, they just schedule a new launch. Not quite so fast. The repair itself has to be tested thoroughly. They'll run multiple checks to make absolutely sure the leak is gone. And this is crucial that the repair work didn't accidentally cause any new problems or stress points. More pressure tests, maybe vacuum tests, detail inspections. They might even decide they need to do another static fire test to be absolutely certain the fix holds up under real operational conditions. And then everyone involved has to sign off. NASA, ICERO, Axiom. Absolutely. All the repair data, all the test results have to be reviewed and get the green light from the engineering and safety teams at Axiom, NASA, and ISRO. NASA in particular has very specific requirements for flying crew. Only when every single partner is satisfied and any regulatory approvals are in place, only then will they set a new launch date. And yeah, that whole process takes time. Could be weeks, could be months, depending on they find. But like the sources stress, that time is non-negotiable for mission success and especially for crew safety. So yeah, while the delay is no doubt a letdown for the crew, for India, for space fans, everywhere, this decision is actually, you know, a really strong signal. It shows that rigorous safety-first culture that has to define human spaceflight today. It's proof of the maturity and the discipline of all the partners, including ISR's key role. It really shows the promise isn't just getting to space, it's getting there safely. Group Captain Shukla's historic flight, all that amazing science they planned, it's being paused just to make sure it happens under the absolute safest conditions. Uh, it reminds me of that classic saying you hear from astronauts and engineers. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Better to be on the ground wishing you were in space. Than in space wishing you were on the ground. Exactly. That really sums up the whole philosophy here. This incident, this seemingly small technical detail, a LOX leak found during a routine test, it's a powerful reminder. Even after all these years, spaceflight is still incredibly difficult. Every single launch that goes right is built on this immense foundation of careful planning, endless testing, and this obsessive attention to detail, just like the static fire test demonstrated. It really does underline the sheer complexity, doesn't it? The level of precision needed is just staggering. It truly is. So maybe something for you, the listener, to think about. Consider that almost absolute need for certainty in human spaceflight. How does that level of caution compare to the risks we accept, maybe without even realizing it, in other parts of life? Or with other technologies we use every day? What can we learn from how the space industry tries to balance pushing boundaries with guaranteeing safety? Just some to mull over. Good question. Well, thank you for joining us on this deep dive into the sources behind the Axiom 4 mission delay.